Here we go. Record. All right. All right. Good to see so many of you come out on a Wednesday night. What's up, Juan Ponce? What's up, JP? Good to see you. What's happening, Ty? Good to see you, brother. Good to see you, Rudy. Good to see you, Jennifer. Good to see you, Daryl. Good to see, uh, let's see, who else is here? Isaac. So many good people. Tia, good to see you. Love it, love it, love it. So we're going to get started in a few minutes. Um, super excited. We have Michael Zuber here. Michael Zuber, as you know, um, to me, one of the best uh, content providers on, let me mute him. I also got it. Naomi, do you have the ability to co-host and help me kind of crack down on noise if? Yes. Okay, cool. All right. So we've got Michael Zuber here. Phenomenal guest. If you don't know, you need to know one rental at a time. It's some of the best content on YouTube. In my opinion, like top two or three real estate content on YouTube. The guy puts out like five, six videos a day, 30 plus 25, 30 videos uh, plus a week, all really high impact, all high education, all high value. Um, we're going to get started. I'm going to interview Michael. And Michael also, just so you guys know, is, um, is, a good, is a good friend with Pace and with Laura. Laura, he does a, a weekly show too, right, Michael? Sundays at 8 a.m. Sundays at 8 a.m. So him and Laura Morby. Pace's wife, they do a show. He does uh, another show with Dana Rylas, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. What day is that? Mondays at nine. Mondays at nine. So how you doing today, Michael? I'm doing great, man. I look forward to this. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So as people are jumping on, I know Jade, Jade just had a closing and I, I want to showcase Jade for a moment. Uh, Jade, Jade is a part of the NorCal group, her, Naomi, and Noah built out a, uh, a door knocking team. And so we want to celebrate that success. Jade and Naomi, why don't you tell that story before we get started? Naomi, yeah. do you want to start? Oh. Go for it, Jade. You start us off because you're always so quiet. <laughs> okay. So we had a door knocker go to a um, pre foreclosure. He missed her, left a note. She called him back. And then um, from there, Naomi was able to negotiate and we thought we were in the clear. Um, from then, Naomi introduced me to the seller and I was the one that, I was the one that handled her, I guess you could say. She tried to back out because another investor, um, she had been working with another investor. So she sent Ty a note or a letter. I don't even know. I can't remember what the letter said exactly. Mm -hmm. trying, to, trying, trying to get out of the um, contract. And then just, she needed, she needed a lot of handholding. We talked pretty much every other day. I talked to her more than I talked to my, my own mom <laughs> in the last two months. I was in Hawaii on vacation and I talked to her probably every day that I was there. <laughs> um, and then this last week, she, we were we were about to sign and she texts me the day that everybody's trying to get a hold of her to schedule this signing and says, uh, actually, my daughter's gonna pay my arrears. I, I don't need you guys anymore. After this two months of talking to her, hand holding, and then we finally sent the original door knocker to her house and he bought her lunch and was like, hey, like, let's make this happen. What's going on? And so she finally signed and we closed last week. I love it. <laughs> great job great job jade J jade under she under under told the story the lady called jade she said all every day which was true she called jade every other day trying to cancel <laughs> or saying another investor showed up on her doorstep or somebody called her last <laughs> night and offered her more money or i mean every other day it was like a battle to try to keep her in naomi is there anything you want to add to that well, I think Michael already heard this um, the other day, but she basically moved out. And then I guess because she hadn't gotten paid, she moved back in and she's like, they're trying to change the locks. And, uh, well, yeah, you're out of there. Uh, so it was, it was interesting. Um, yeah, but got it close. Congratulations everybody to especially, you know, Ty and Jade. They really did their magic. So thank you. It's a, it was a team effort. 
yeah, couldn't have done it without Naomi and Ty and Rochelle. I don't think she's here, but Rochelle was a big help in this too. You're right. I Yeah, Rochelle obviously is not here, but Rochelle, between Rochelle and Jade, you know, keeping her locked in and the escrow officer, um, and the escrow officer going on vacation. And, and her whole, assistant. And her, <laughs> the whole thing was a mess. And Noah's a part of that too. So Noah... Noah recruited, how many door knockers did you recruit over a two month period? Maybe, I, I feel like 30 to 40. I wanna feel, I wanna say. Oh. Yeah. I love it. So that's our guy, Noah, a part of the team. I just wanna say absolutely a team effort. Great job, Naomi. Great job, Jade. Great job, Noah. We'll definitely, um, and we're definitely, hopefully I'll get a wire in the next 24 hours and I'll do a distribution. So love it. Thank you guys. Love it. Love it. Love it. Great work. Jade, Naomi, Noah. Thank you. And Ulysses, right? The guy that Ulysses, yeah. Yeah. he's not Ulysses. here though, is he? Is he a no, part of he's not. Okay. No, he's not sub two. Love it. Love it. Okay. So I just want to go ahead and get it started. We waited about nine minutes. Um, if you don't know, I've said it before. <laughs> We have such a great guest here, Mr. Michael Zuber. Michael is in the Bay Area. He owns a lot of properties. He's a landlord. He's an author. Uh, but the thing that I'm most impressed about Michael isn't about how many doors he owns. He owns over 175 doors. It's not that. It's not his net worth. It's not his balance sheet. The thing I love about Michael is he's a go-giver. The guy gives and gives and gives. Actually, when I asked you, Michael, to show up, because I know how intense your schedule is and how you start early in the morning. I was like, kind of like, uh, I was going to say, it's okay if you say no, don't worry about it, whatever. So thank you, Michael, for being here. How are you doing tonight? Uh, uh, you invite me to anything, Ty, I'm going to show up. How about that? Just, you don't even have to think about it anymore. Just ask and I'll be there. I love it. I love it. Thank oh, you wow. for being here. So for those of you, if you guys are just jumping on, please mute yourselves. Um, let me see real quick. I think I can hit mute all. I just want to make sure allow participants to unmute themselves. Um, I'm just going to do this to be safe here. Okay. So Michael, if you can unmute, there we go. All right. So why don't you just tell everybody a little bit for a few of them that don't know, tell them a little of your backstory, how you got started and that mm -hmm. part. So again, Michael Zuber, I lived in the Silicon Valley for 50 years. Uh, I'm the, you know, I'm a tech worker. Uh, we started and went to Santa Clara University, St. Francis High School. So I'm a local kid, uh, you know, got uh, an accounting degree, went, went to work for a, you know, computer desk, disk, disk drive company and then consulting and then worked my way into pre-sales and sales. So I spent the last 20 years in a commission based job where I could be fired every 90 days. So I get pressure. Uh, I am often referred to as a jackhammer because when I focus on something, I can I can keep going and be excited about the next step the next day and not bored by repetition. I don't know what it is in me that I can do that. Hence, I'm creating five or six pieces of original content seven days a week for more than two years now. You know, So uh, I get excited, right? I'm already looking forward to tomorrow uh, and, and I don't think about this morning. So it's just kind of a gift I have. Uh, we, we um, you know, our start in real estate started at 30 after a pretty big stock market loss. Uh, you know, over 150 grand lost in, in a matter of weeks after turning seven grand into 200. And uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad was the start. He changed my mindset. He introduced what now appears to be simple concepts, but nobody in my family. And you got to remember, I had an advanced degree. I had an MBA from a decent university. None of those concepts were talked about. I was raised to be in the rat race. My mother, I still remember, she repeated to me every day of grade school. Now, Michael, Go to school, get good grades so you can get a good job, so you can make a lot of money, and you can buy nice stuff. That was a phrase I heard every day as my mom dropped me off to grade school. Technically, my sister heard it, but I guess she didn't, she didn't really hear it. But that's what I heard, and that's, I, I thought that was winning. I thought having a six-figure job was winning, and all I was doing was spending all my money, uh, not, no net worth to speak of. And um, yeah, so we tried the Bay Area. It didn't work for us because I wanted cash flow, not appreciation. We ultimately decide on Fresno, California, which is a two and a half hour drive for me, 101, 152, 99, uh, if you know the drive, and uh, never look back. We toyed with Texas and Vegas, uh, but I didn't want to rebuild a team. So uh, we started buying in 02, 
We 1031 at the peak, so we got out just fine. Uh, we went all in at the bottom. We used private and hard money. Uh, we did the Burr strategy. I was writing about Burr strategies before it was named on Bigger Pockets. I was a featured blog, a weekly blog post when Brandon Turner was just a um, intern there. So I've been there a lot. Was a speaker at their original event in Denver with Bruce Norris and some other luminaries. I was on the stage. So I've been doing this a while, and uh, now I get more excited about helping others. I have this contest, you know, this 500 contest. It's actually Ty. Ty knows this, but I don't think we've shared this. Ty gave me the idea on a Friday and by Saturday, I'd already had the cards ordered and the sign up behind me because we're going to try to do 500 deals, try to help five, you know, people, 500 people get a deal their first or their next. So um, Ty gets a lot of credit for that. So that, that's who I am. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. I love it. So I just want to just spill, I, I want to really just attack something and I love your theme mm -hmm. one rental at a time. And I just want to be clear, you own, a hundred and I think it's, a, I don't, I don't even count. I think it's 181 because I just closed a duplex last week. Got it. Okay. So he's got 181 doors. Now here's the thing that I want to make that, that I really want to emphasize. Did you go out? You're a smart guy. You've got an MBA. You worked in Silicon Valley and tech. Did you go out and do a syndication and, <laughs> and raise money? And you, you've done five deals to get 181 deals. Tell, no. tell that one rental at a time and how that connects to this. I'm, I'm really glad you asked that. Not enough people ask that because a lot of people talk about units and they, they do a syndication. It's 485 units and they own like 2%. I'm like, well, okay, dude, you own eight doors. You don't own 485. Stop lying. And oh, by the way, you're just a, you know, you're a capital raiser. You didn't do any deals. You didn't evaluate, didn't learn a market. You don't, you, you, you don't know anything about being a landlord, right? You got a couple of rich friends and you got two points of the deal. No, this is something that Olivia, who's my better half, my wife, um, and I got all together. Uh, we have raised private money, millions of dollars in private money, but that's banks. Those aren't, I do not have a partner on any deal. Uh, we started with a house and then a second house and then a third house and, it's just, uh, we just kept growing. Real estate investing, once you learn a market, once you, once you realize it's a skill, real estate investing is a skill. And once you learn it and you build confidence in yourself, you can do it the rest of your life. I plan to be buying deals the rest of my life. Uh, but also I will sell what's expensive. That's another thing about our story is we are buy and hold investors. Our intention is to hold everything we have until we die. However, as we've proven multiple times, if you want to overpay for what we own, we will gladly sell it to you and move that money somewhere else. And that's how we went from eight to 80 units in 2006 and seven. Uh, as the world was about to explode, we were like, whoops, we're out of houses and uh, we're in apartments. So we watch the market every day. Uh, I, I still look, at, I get excited about looking at my market every day still. Um, so I, I'm, I'll never stop. I can't hear you, Ty. So tell them a little bit about the, um, maybe a little teaser on how you look at the market every day, twice a day, the morning, the afternoon. And, and specifically, here's the thing for everybody. Do yourself a favor, follow Michael on YouTube. He has the best financial news content out there, better than CNBC, better than uh, The Real Deal, better than all of the different syndication news that are even specialized in real estate news. Here's why is because this guy has a stake in it, mm -hmm. right? He's one of us. He's an investor. He's an entrepreneur. He's still acquiring doors. He's still growing. Michael, tell them about your discipline, just a little bit about that morning and, and evening yeah. and kind of how you digest news and, and prep. Yeah. So what I, so again, so my morning routine is, is pretty consistent. I'm a morning person. I haven't had an alarm clock in a couple of decades. My I'm, if I'm up, at, not up at by five 45, I'm probably dead. It's just how I'm wired. I get up it, even, I mean, I can go to like new year's Eve. I go to bed at one 30. I'm still up at 45, 45. I just don't know what I don't, I don't, I don't know what 6am feels like. So I get up, my wife's a evening person, not a morning. So I get a couple of hours by myself. So what I've done the last two decades is I get up, I make some coffee and I read what's going on. What am I reading, uh, trying to read? Here's the difference between me and everybody else. Everybody else is trying to scare you, get clickbaits, all that nonsense. I have been reading for my own personal benefits for two decades and I'm still doing it today. I just take notes. I wanna know what's going on with the consumer. The consumer is 68% of our economy, but more importantly, the consumer is my biggest competitor. 
who am I competing with when I'm trying to buy a house or a duplex or, a, you know, a quad? I'm not the real deal talking about a 450 unit apartment building like one of us can look at, right? I'm looking for houses or five units or 10 units. I will, I will only talk about what we've done and the biggest we bought was 20 units. That's it. That's, that's all I can talk about, right? So um, I'm reading to figure out what's going on in the consumer. The consumer is a very fickle creature. They get scared, they get greedy. They get scared, they get greedy. I'm trying to figure that out. I'm also trying to watch banks. Banks have the money, they make the rules. Sometimes they lend easy, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they get scared out of nowhere and pull loans last minute, right? What is going on there? So that's what I'm trying to figure out. Uh, now I'm watching inflation. Uh, I am very clear that I, I, am, I spent so much time on a, a report. I don't know, what's it been a month, maybe six weeks on 50 years of research. I went all the way back to 1970 and grabbed all these metrics. And really what I've come to, I didn't know what I was going to find when I spent out, it probably 20 hours, maybe 30 hours pulling all this together. Uh, what I found is the next decade could very much be like the 1970s. And here's a hint. If you bought a house in 1970, you had an interest rate of eight and a half percent. Fast forward to 1979, so the full decade, interest rates went up 300 basis points. So they're now 11 and a half. How many of you, and I'm going to ask this question, and if you've watched me, you don't get to answer, but how many of you think real estate would collapse if interest rates went up 300 or 300 basis points? Who, who, who thinks it's going to collapse or, or you know, raise your hand or do whatever you do? Raise your hand and just maybe turn your camera on. If, if you think, say the question again, and we want to see everybody vote. So go yeah. ahead and ask the question if, one more if time. If you think real estate will collapse, if interest rates on 30-year mortgages go from three to say 7%, does real estate explode and nobody does deals and it's over for all of us? <laughs> I see in the chat, people are saying collapse. It's not over. Nice. I, um, I see some people shaking their heads. Buy deeper. Saying no. <laughs> oh, good. Never. You guys are, I love it. <laughs> you guys are much smarter than the average person. The average person out there goes, if interest rates go up that much, housing is dead. How many YouTubers out there are going, oh my God, interest rates go up 1%, real estate's over, blah, 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 blah. Well, here's the deal. If you bought in 1970 at eight and a half, and by 1979, interest rates are 11 and a half percent, three things are true. One, your payment didn't change because you had a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Who cares what the rate is in 79? Two, the value of your property went up 103%. So congratulations, it doubled. And third, Rent went up 117%. So not only have you doubled the value, your rent's up 117%. You have monster cash flow. You're loving life. So again, uh, I think we're going to have a decade of inflation, certainly five years of inflation. So what am I really doing right now? I am trying to buy as many cash flow properties, residential. I don't want interest rate risk. I'm, I am deathly afraid of what happens to interest rates in like 2025, 2026 but I'll go get all the 30 year money I can. I, I believe in this so much folks that I am borrowing money on free and clear properties. That's what I'm doing right now. And uh, I'm going to buy as many resis as I can. I love it. I love it. And so I love Dustin's already got his hand up. So you'll definitely be the first for questions. When we go to questions, I'm going to ask maybe one and maybe a follow-up. Um, so Michael, talk about we, we've talked about this lately, probably the last couple of months, you and I, about projection, projection forecast. So two, it's a two, two, uh, two part question. Okay. So the forecast of what we kind of what you believe is going to happen over the next three to six months mm -hmm. with residential real estate. Mm -hmm. And then also too, if there is a recession, mm. remember the opportunity we've talked about, and you've even talked about it on the other call on Tuesday. Yeah. Elaborate on that. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things. I think first and foremost, heading into the end of the year, we as real estate investors, specifically you as real estate investors, door knocking, all of those things, you have a very unique opportunity. In my 20 years of doing this, there's only been a few times where the calendar becomes my friend. So what has happened the last 14 or 15 or 18 months? First and foremost, if you are a land, like an older landlord you own for 20 years, um, you're probably pretty upset right? Because uh, eviction moratoriums and this and that and government interference and all of those things. So you're kind of crabby. Now, you're also hearing about the government very likely to raise your taxes. 
Uh, so especially, you know, go heading into next year. So there are a lot of landlords that I'm specifically, I always share what I'm doing. I'm actually marketing to every landlord in Fresno who's owned for more than 20 years saying, Hey, I wrote this book one minute till at a time, all about Fresno. I'd love to talk to you just to see, you know, if I could buy someone's, you know, I'd love to buy some portfolios, right? That's, that's how big I want to play here, but th that's what I'm doing. And I'm using the clock, right? I'm using, Hey, do seller financing. I'll give you some money. Now I'll pay a little later, reduce your taxes, installment sale, all of those things. So I think that I think seller financing has a, a real chance the next three months. If you, fo if you fast forward into next year where I really am getting fearful about a recession, right? The business cycle is real. Um, we will have another recession. I just think it's closer than most people think. And if that's the case, uh, recessions lead to job losses. Uh, I suspect the recession won't be another national um, economic shutdown. So you won't have foreclosure moratoriums and things of that nature. So it will be the time to go ham on subject two. If, if I see a recession coming, I will tweak my marketing to anybody that bought in the last 12 months, probably less than 5% down because they don't, because they can't hire an agent at that point. And uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go get that, uh, you know, really cheap debt that's uh, fixed for 30 years. So I think reset the next recession, whether it's in February or November of next year, uh, it will be the time for sub two to just go nuts. I love that. I love that. I think we got to get you back on with pace and, and really have that specific conversation. That's such a, I, I think it's such an opportunity. I think this group, I know a lot of 80, 90% of the people here are a part of the sub two community. Mm -hmm. And I just want to really emphasize, we've all been spending a lot of time talking about creative and sub two. Most investors do not. True. Most investors are fixing, flipping, buy and hold, burr, yeah, they're doing cash and, you know, flipping the burr or, or yeah, it's, it's that the, again, let's just talk about the cycle. Every real, every portion of the real estate cycle has the easiest thing to do. 2020 through right now, the easiest thing to do was to buy a dump, fix it up and sell it FHA. It's easy. It was printing money. Um, I mean, it was, it would, it, you didn't even have to do a good job and you would make a lot of money. That is about to be over. As inventory rises, as the winter sets in, as a recession comes around, if, if you're still flipping mediocre stuff, you're about to lose a lot of money, right? The, the, the days of eh, going for retail are over or just about over. But that will meter bring something else. I believe between now and the end of the year, seller financing has a shot, especially if they've owned them for a long time. But I'm excited about sub two. Um, right as the next recession kicks off uh, is, uh, is going to be... I mean, and the beauty about the next recession is the Fed isn't going to have a lot of bullets left in the gun to really go after it. So the next recession, it may not be deep, but I suspect it will be long, which will mean you get a long time to play in this game. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Michael. Let's go ahead and go to some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute Dustin. If you have, we have the reaction down at the bottom of the screen. You have the reaction. You have the ability to raise your hand. You see that, or you can uh, thumbs up, <laughs> right? Or I was having fun, sorry. Or a heart. Yeah, Aww. there you go. There we go. So um, so you can raise your hand there. So Joe, I'm going to go ahead and start with Dustin. Go for it, Dustin. Hey, what's going on, guys? Hey, Michael, thanks for uh, coming in. It's awesome to listen sure. to you talk. And I really appreciate you giving the uh, market insights because that's something I kind of follow too. So I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are about, I mean, I guess, you know, inflation, but really to me, I'm seeing the biggest concern is the affordability index. And what is your thoughts on that? Well, the affordability index, if you've heard my story at all, is the thing that I watch Paramount. It tells me when to get out of residential. Right? Yep. So I've been watching Fresno for a long time. And as of right now, Fresno is still healthy. It's, it's 41 or 39, depending on where you are. And just to put it in context, I wouldn't be nervous until it got to 20. So plenty of room. Here's the twist, though. That can change in a heartbeat because there are three factors that make it up. One is price, obviously. Yep. That's kind of moves slowly. The, interest the, rates. Yeah, interest rates and income, right? Mm -hmm. So interest rates is the bugaboo, right? If interest rates yep. jumped a full point, I haven't done the math, but I suspect it would go from 40 to 30 like that. Yeah. Then it's, you know, okay. But, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been rough and tough 40 for two years now. So it's still got room, but uh, I'm certainly watching it. 
Yeah, because like San Diego County, where I'm from, I've been I used to flip quite a bit before mm-hmm. going virtual and buying rentals and stuff. But cool. I mean, San Diego has dropped to a twenty. Uh, yeah. it's it's been lower, but since like you said, interest rates yeah, so went lower. It went you know. It was, I would Dustin, that's a great question. It's funny somebody in my my group today, Ty might have saw talked about San Diego. What I would tell everybody to do, especially if you're in California, because there's the California Association of Realtors, car.org. That's yep. my source. Yep. Um, I don't know. I don't know other states. So go look it up. I don't know. But what I would do, Dustin, is I would go look at 2005, six and seven, or maybe six, seven and eight. I yep. think somebody told me San Diego got as low as 11. Oh, it did. When I got out of the market five years ago, flipping, Mm-hmm. I was concerned about that, right? So I stopped flipping because I was doing longer term flips, like adding bedrooms, bathrooms, oh, right? Yeah. Ooh. And we were down at 14%. Oof. Yeah. But then, you know, interest rates dropped to below four, three and, and then, a half, then three. Yeah. So it, it, it kind of changes out. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, I would, uh, again, you know, because again, my market, just for context, you, yours got as low as 11, mine got as low as 20. That's why you get to 21, 22. I'm nervous. Um, you know, 20, but yeah, I mean, San Diego, the price point is so high, right? Rates jump one, you're at 12, right? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't it's know. Market-based then pretty yeah, much. It's, it's, oh yeah, it's definitely to. market-based. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the market in the country, I, I'm willing to call one market. I, I, I don't use this term lightly. I think there's one bubble market in the country and it's Boise, Idaho. Hell yeah. I, I've seen some <laughs> very unnatural things in Boise. I'm like, mm-hmm that's not that's gonna hurt i mean it's california prices now i've, I've looked recently too yeah it's, it's not good yeah yeah there's no income there to support it it's it's just it's it's damn near shanghai prices i mean jesus they're so unaffordable but yeah. that's i think again san diego to 20 when it can when it's already proven to get as low as 11 you know it's pay attention yeah. but it's you know it's pay attention i guess and then I had one other question because <laughs> sub two, I mean, is obviously that's where the majority of us are coming from is a sub two group. Sure. And it, it's definitely a great strategy. My only concern is that in, in you know, interest rates go up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, banks are going to start looking at that due on sales clause a lot more because, I mean, in the 80s, that's yeah. when the due on sales clause was implemented, right? That's sure. when banks started putting it. So that's that's kind of my own concern. But I yeah, think I don't know. I mean, so many- yeah, I think, uh, I mean, anything is possible, right? We all know that that's a risk um, in a rising interest in rate environment. I don't know. It depends on why the rates are going up. If we're in a recession, banks are banks going to want to take the payment. Banks aren't going to care. Yeah. If the, if the, if the economy is going gangbusters, maybe. But I think, I think it's a valid concern, but I would, you know, I'd still go ham. Yeah, I think you you said it right there. I didn't even think about that. If they're getting their payments and the economy is not really doing so well, they're, they're not, not going to care. They're yeah. not going to care. Yep. No. Cool. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate that. You got it, Dustin. Good luck. Great question. I, uh, follow up on that, Dustin, in terms of, because I have had the due on sale clause called on me. And so what I, what I believe it is, it has a lot more to do with servicers. Mm-hmm. People that don't really own the debt, they're just servicing it yep. versus when you have portfolio. Oh, mm-hmm. we lose you, Ty. I was going to say, is that me? Did I? <laughs> He's frozen. It's like this. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, Ty. Naomi, is Ty still there? He, I still see him here, but... <laughs> Well, we just continue, I think. Okay. I think, can you, can Joe, I think Joe is the next question, if I understand what he was doing? Yes. Yeah, I can jump in here. Thank you, Hi, Joe. How mm-hmm. you doing? Good. Just started your course about a week ago, a lot of good information. So thank awesome. you for that. Um, of course. I'm just curious, this may be an amateur question, but something with over like 180 doors, uh-huh. um, what would you say is your biggest pain point right now? With having that many doors if you can kind of share a little so bit. the so the operational side is that right is that what you're asking about joe yes just owning that many houses or doors right i'm just uh, very so i'm like if i had 100 doors i mean i couldn't imagine yeah operationally how do you keep up with that or just what maybe you keep up well you have another pain point that you can kind of so i think there's a couple of things one thing that i don't know that i've said here uh but obviously i pay a property manager and, and I have enough doors where I have one kind of one throat to choke. I have one person to call. 
and I've worked with her long enough where um, I get daily I get daily reports on stuff I want to see. So everything is kind of operationalized. I would say operating um, the actual units, everything is pretty smooth now. That wasn't the case in the beginning because I had I did fire the first five property managers. That was hard, and we only had like five or eight units. That was tough. Uh, I would say my biggest pain point now, frankly, is keeping up with all my damn insurance payments. <laughs> okay. Freaking, yeah, because I have my residentials over here, my commercials over there, my umbrellas over here. That's a lot harder than it should be. Okay. So that's that's the biggest pain point. Uh, that I could tell you also, just because we're talking, uh, I had great rent collections th throughout the crisis, but for whatever reason, the last month, I've had more I've had more COVID letters in the last month than I had the first 15 months. I don't know what's going on, this whole cancel rent thing or whatnot's going on, but uh, still not horrible. But I did notice, I'm like, damn, we got another one? What the hell? So it is crazy. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate of, it. Of course. It's because nobody wants to go back to work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what the hell? Go get a job. So, pretty funny. I think Daryl's next if we're doing this right, left to right, I think. Daryl Banks. The creative closer is on mute. Hey, hey, how you doing, guys? There he is. Hi, Daryl. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dustin, for the invite, guy. Thank you, man. Uh -huh. um, I got two questions. Um, first question, you might answer this. Um, it's okay. What do you what What's like your your time limit as far as return on investment? How how soon do you want your return on invest investment is that like three mm. five seven years and like how do you feel as far as like having um rental properties not in your immediate area or out of state actually so uh so i'll answer the second one first you may not know this daryl my market is two and a half hours away so it's not my backyard it might as well be out of state but technically it's not california is a pretty big state uh so i'm comfortable with that but it's all about the boots on the ground um, but it, it takes so much time in networking to get boots on the ground that you trust, uh, that if you're going out of state, you know, you got to get on an airplane to see your stuff. You've got to invest in boots on the ground, double check, quality check, do all those things. Um, so that's answer number two. Uh, frankly, one more thing on that boots on the ground are more important than the market. If there were two markets, market a was like the most appreciating market ever. You can't do a bad deal, but you knew no one. And then there was kind of a middle of the road market where you had, you know, your college roommate was there and your, your sister lives there or whatever it is. I would choose market B. Uh, I have seen people get ripped off, go bankrupt in great markets with horrible teams. So boots on the ground for me are, are paramount. Uh, question one, I don't think about time. Uh, my whole strategy, my whole course is built around what I call a yield. I try to, I, I really look at every investment I made as a bond. And what I want to know is I, I want to spend time. I want to do the daily disciplines and I want to go, hey, Daryl, my market of Fresno, California in 2021 is a 6%. What that means is the average deal in my market will produce a 6%. I don't know about you, Daryl, but I have zero interest to be an average. So all I look for is seven and a half, eight, nine. And if I can get a 10% deal, that's what I'm looking for. Something above seven and a half. I don't care about return on time or I don't, I don't think that way. That help. Okay. Thank you. Of course. I think Naomi's next. If we, if I got this right. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Michael. I always appreciate when you come on these calls. Mm -hmm. um, I know on Tuesday, we sort of scratched the surface on talking about sort of, you know, I think a lot of people here, there's a lot of seasoned people, but there's also a lot of newbies. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, like your criteria, your buying criteria for mm. maybe a first or second or just the first couple of deals that you do? Yeah, what I would tell, what I would tell all new investors, as I've come to try to tell people, I believe real estate investing is a skill. And because it's a skill, I think it could be learned. But it only is learned by repetition and, and focus. So I believe every new investor needs to go uh, and, and create what I call a tight buy box. So I'll use my example for you, right? So I live in Mountain View, California, can't make a deal work here. I go, damn it, I'm not going to get on an airplane. So check out of states off the market. My wife, again, is much smarter than I am. She goes, hey, let's pull out a California map and see where we go. 
we find Fresno, California. I've been there one time in my life when I drove through at 13, right? I didn't even know it was there. And, uh, but it made sense, right? Live where you want, but invest where the numbers make sense. So I pull up the Fresno City MLS or realtor.com or whatever it was back in the day. And I look and there's 6,000 listings, too big. No, you, can't, you can't go through that as a newbie and learn anything. So I start by building my network. I start finding agents and property managers. And I ask everybody, what's a blue collar neighborhood, right? What's a blue collar neighborhood? So after asking 10 or 12 people, they all talk about this thing called the Mayfair District. It happens to be 93703. I go, great. I'm going to look at the Mayfair District. So I go from 6,000 listings to like, I don't know, 300. Still too much, right? Dude, I got a day job. I'm working 80 hours a week. I'm on three different continents a week. I got a sales commission around my neck. If I don't do it, I get fired. I don't got time for 300. Great. I got to keep talking. I need, I need tighter. So then I go, okay, I'm going to do houses. So that means no condos, no townhomes, no lands, no mobile homes, no apartments, no duplexes, quads, tries, whatever. So I go from 300 to 215. Still too much. I go, shit. All right. I'm going to do three and four bedrooms. So, okay, two bedrooms go away, right? The old homes, the big homes go away. I go from 215 to, I don't know, 167. Too much. I go, okay, God damn it. I'm going to do three or four bedrooms, 1,200 to 1,500 square feet, uh, single story with a garage, attached garage. Oh, bingo, 38 listings. So that's my criteria. It's close to what I used. And that's what I looked at for three years, Naomi, every day. And that means if it wasn't a three or four bedroom in the Mayfair, one story with an attached garage, I did not care. I didn't look. I didn't get confused. Because what am I trying to do when I learn Fresno? I need to learn the rents. I need to know repairs. I need to know contractors and painters. I'm trying to get all this stuff. But my, my job is to find a good or great deal. So I was able to find deals, good or great deals, a la Norris Drive, which I write about in the book, because of my tight criteria. And I didn't leave that criteria for almost three years. So that's what I mean. Get focused. Don't overthink it. If you're a new investor and you're looking in Austin, Texas and Cleveland, Ohio and Huntsville, Alabama, you ain't going anywhere. All those markets are different. You'll get all totally confused and you'll actually go backwards. Get hyper focused. Thank you so much. I think, uh, is that Lee is next? Yeah, that's my daughter's name. My name's Sal. Sorry about oh, that. All right, Sal. How are you? I, I was going to say that might be Leah, but I, I'm not going to say that if I see a guy's face. <laughs> it's all good. I couldn't figure out how to change your name, but it's all good. Um, I had a question for you um, when you were talking about like, uh, you know, the market in the next few years, and sure. you said this going to be a recession and everything. Mm -hmm. And I definitely agree with you. Sub two is the way to go, right? Because people got to get out. And if 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 real estate does go down or you know, have a little uh, hiccup and, and adjust. I don't think real estate's going to stop, but I think if there is a recession, it will slow down compared to what all these crazy people that are overbidden on prices. Um, so going back to sub twos, since mm -hmm. a lot of us are from sub two here, yeah. um, we want to keep these things because if we can pick them up now with the three, 4% oh. interest rate that these people bought them at, but what happens when we are doing um, like balloons, so mm -hmm. stay away from trying to get sub twos with balloons, because if we have a five-year balloon, then we're going to have to either cash out or find someone. Yeah, I, I would. That... Uh, I do not like anything with a balloon or adjustable rate mortgage. But the good news, um, Sal, is what I've been reading is 98% of loans originated for owner ox in the last two years have been 30-year or 15-year fixed. Right. I, I, so, I'm sorry if I, if I uh, got you confused. Like sometimes we have... Uh, some equity in the house and the oh, owner, I'm oh, sorry. The, the, it's, it's okay. Like the owner wants a balloon and wants to mm -hmm. cash out. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you stay away from, uh, I, I mean, if you, you, I mean, the owner's got a bunch of equity and you can't get it out for a little while. I mean, sometimes you got to do a balloon in that case. I'm sorry. Now I understand. Um, right. So if we, if we take, I would never do anything shorter than five years. I wouldn't, I mean, I've had five-year balloons on seller finance deals. Five years goes by so fast. Yeah, it does. Um, I would, I wouldn't, I would try to negotiate to 10. I mean, 10 years, I'd feel fine with. Uh, lots of things change in 10 years. You'll probably have enough mortgage pay down where you can get rid of the property. Or you could do a, you know, some kind of other seller second or private money. Uh, but if you had to take five years, I'd probably take it. I don't think I would take anything less than five years. Sure. And, and one last thing. I know, Ty, right before you, uh, you got 
disconnected. You said that you had a, a, a do on sale and same thing with you, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, you, you weren't worried about what Dustin was talking about of do on sale, but do you take them in trust or do you just take them right in your LLCs? When you, when you do I would think Pace would be a better answer for that. He does these all well, the time. We, we know what Pace does. Pace does LLCs. He doesn't okay, really well, do trust. There you uh, go then. <laughs> a lot of us in the group do because okay. we are afraid of that do on sale clause. And we know that trusts do hide it better. I, uh, again, as I said at the very beginning, I've yet to do one. So I don't feel qualified to answer. Um, I, Pace okay. is the man. I'm not going to disagree with him. Ty, was yours on a trust or an LLC? I've done, yeah, I've done trust in LLCs and my own name. Um, and there's no real di difference. And, and when I got cut off, I apologize. I don't know, a little interruption in the internet, but basically like, I don't know the percentage, but I, I believe it's somewhere in the 73, 78% of all mortgages are um, of residential mortgages are agency and service based, meaning the person you're making the payment to the doesn't servicer, actually, yeah. yeah, they're a yeah. servicer. They don't actually, they're not the lender. They're not the beneficial interest. They're not the actual money. It's some pension fund or foreign investment trust or something like that. So point being is that on portfolio loans, meaning if it's Bank of America and Bank of America servicing it and they originated it and it's, then you may, I would be a little bit more concerned and have maybe a backup you know, two or three backups of an exit strategy if you get the do on sell clause. I had the do on sell clause called on me. And here's what they did. They didn't actually do a default. They sent me a letter and they said, hey, you either need to refinance this or you need to sell it or it needs to get deeded back to the original owner. Mm. One of the three things. So I basically, I don't even remember. I think I might've flipped it or I I don't remember, maybe I had 1031 exchanged or I might even refight it, but it wasn't a problem. I had plenty of time to get out of it. So um, even if they had filed the notice of default, which Michael, we talk about all the time for closures mm -hmm. in California, they should call it slow closure. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because it's so slow. It's like 700 days, right? 700 plus average, days to yeah. foreclose. So just because of all the delays and such. So um, I wouldn't be overly concerned about the due on sale clause myself. So, all right, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Sure. Thanks, Al. Hey, Jonah, I think you're next for doing this right. Hey, hey. hi. Yeah. Hi. So, my question actually is I'm just curious because I work in Fresno, I work all over Northern California. Do you sure. ever flip or do you ever look for wholesale buy and hold deals or anything like that? I will I, buy I, every, uh, yeah, I flip all the time. I have two active flips in escrow right now to sell. I have no other projects coming, so I'm dry. Yeah. I buy from wholesalers all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Would I, can I uh, can I add you to my buyers list? That's of course, I would hope so. Right I would yeah, hope that's so. My, that's my question. You, yeah, uh, please do. Will, will you drop your email in the chat or? Sure. Why not? Thank you. Can I do that here? Yeah, I can do that. I'm typing right now. Is Daryl next again? I think. I'm typing. Go ahead, Daryl. If you want to ask your question, I can listen. I think. I okay. Can you hear me? I can. Awesome. Have you, um, or you or Ty, have you ever um, purchased anything on a quick claim deed? Mm, purchased on a quick claim deed. I don't think I've purchased on a quick claim deed. No, I don't think so. I, I don't like quick claim deeds. In fact, Naomi and Noah and I own a property where the title got clouded because they kept, there was a family member who got sick. He deeded it to his son. The son deeded it to his mom because he couldn't manage the property. Mm. And there was a series of quick claim deeds and it actually created a cloud on title in California. And I think, um, I think there's two terms and I think it's a universal term. So it's either a grant deed is what we use in California. Correct. Okay. And then I believe the universal term would be also be called a warranty deed. If, if I'm not mistaken, a warranty deed in other parts of the other country. Other parts, yeah. We use a grant deed. Yeah. yeah, grant deed. And that's the kind of deed, as an example, I'm working on something. Actually, Naomi, this was one of your leads we talked to a couple weeks ago. Um, I talked to a guy. He's like, hey, look, if you just give me $20,000, I'll deed the house to you. 
and we'll do those kinds of deals, but we would have a notary do a grant deed. It's a subject to, it's just a subject to without title insurance, basically. So we would do those. It, it, it really depends on the deal. I don't advocate doing it. I would say use an escrow title or a closing attorney, mm -hmm. um, especially if you're newer to sub two. Um, but anyway, hopefully, did that help, Daryl? Yeah, yeah. Um, the reason I asked was because I was talking to a seller and that's kind of like um, what he presented to me that he would do the deal, but he wanted to, um, you know, do a quick claim because he couldn't afford to go through the probate process. Him and his sister are the remaining heirs and she, um, I guess, uh, relinqu relinquished her rights to the property to him. What state? Uh, Tulsa. Okay, Oklahoma. Oh, okay. Oklahoma. Yeah. So, you know, get together with Dustin. Dustin actually does a lot in um, Oklahoma and he's, he's, he knows Oklahoma pretty well. Dustin Kutcher here in the group. And then, um, you know, I think, I think I would consult an attorney only because with the probate, you may end up with a clouded title that you may never be able to get out yeah, of. Yeah, non marketable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if it's yeah, non mark, just, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say one of the things, I mean, I don't know, if, I don't know where you're, the deal or anything, but I have worked with sellers and paid probate fees. I just take it out of the, their cut. Um, but yeah, I do everything through title escrow. I don't want clouded titles. Okay. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're going to Tanisha next, I think. Hello. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm great. I'm slightly late. I just wanted to um, take a second to thank you for your book. Oh, sure. It was actually the first, it was the first book that I read when I thought about um, starting to invest in rentals. So um, wow, that's nice. I just wanted to take a second to thank you. This is pretty exciting that you're doing the Zoom with us. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for that. That's, that's always wonderful to hear. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Let's go more questions. I'm going to tee up a question for you. So Michael, so in terms of, um, I know we talked about it a little bit, but I want you to elaborate on it because I mm -hmm. thought it was so well said and you went a little fast with it tonight. I think it might've oh. went over some people's head, not because you went fast, but we were just excited to have you. Sure. Tell them the part about just in terms of landlords and pulling up an absentee owner list and just maybe oh, yeah. go into that a little deeper. I, I think that's really important because a lot of people are trying to figure out who do I market to? Who's the best candidate, especially in California? Michael, yeah. let's elaborate on that. Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, given the applications that we all have now, I use PropStream, others use Property Radar. There's probably dozens or more that I don't know about. I'm always thinking about is who do I want to connect with, right? So it's the question. So I, again, give away everything that I'm doing. So what am I doing right now? I just sent out a, a, a mailer. I think it was 991 people. This is what it was. And I, actually, let's, let's go back to why I did it first. Basically, what I am thinking about between now and the end of the year, I want to go talk to as many landlords that have owned property for 20 years or more. Why? Well, they bought it for nothing. They got a lot of equity. They've depreciated it to zero. And they're probably pretty cranky about what's happened the last year or so, right? Because they're probably baby boomers. Again, just think about it. They've owned for 20 years. They own more than one, right? So they, they're, they're, they're older, right? They're at least in their late 50s. So what I want to do is I'm going to market to every one of them that owns more than one. And, and um, so I use PropStream for what that's just part of my one rental at a time thing. They give me the login, so I use it. And I pulled up the list. It's got 991 after deduplications dedupl and moving of LLCs. And uh, I'm going to mail it to them. And the mailer is very simple. It's, hi, I'm Michael Zuber. I wrote this book, One Rental at a Time. Like you, I invest in Fresno. Are you up, you know, did you, something like, did you lose any money last year? Are you afraid about higher taxes? If so, let's talk. I'd love to buy your portfolio or something like that. So I, I'm, I'm actively marketing. I'm spending, I think it was, 600 bucks, 661 or something, I think it is. And I think I'm going to hit that mailer every three weeks for the next probably nine weeks. I'll, I'll hit it three times. I love it. I love it. You know, one thing too, and I want to connect the dots here, um, something that Naomi and another group, another mastermind we talked about was something that said a lot in the mainstream media that they're actually right about in that 
we are going to see the largest transference of wealth mm -hmm. over the next, I think, decade or, you know, there's a that time period, five to 10 sure. years. We're going to see the biggest transference of, transference of wealth. So here's what does that really mean? I had an uncle pass away, you know, that was in his 70s, had health issues. He passed away recently. What does that mean? He's transferring his wealth to his kids. There's other parts too. I'll tell you, I picked up a property, a seller finance deal where the guy, basically he needs long-term medical care and he has this house. If, if I bought the house for cash, he wouldn't know what to do with the cash. So instead it made sense for him to say, okay, get a chunk of cash down as a down payment. And now let's take monthly installments, mm -hmm. by the way, no interest rate. Why would you want interest? You have to pay taxes on it, right? Mm -hmm. So so just, I want to just really emphasize with the group, what a great opportunity and what Michael just said, landlords are sick and tired of being sick and tired. It's mm. such a great opportunity. So thank you, Michael, for sharing that. I want to, um, just in terms of like, with regard to the financial news and talking about interest rates, specifically mm -hmm. rates, the next 90 days, we've talked about this, are rates going to spike up or are they probably going to stay low? Well, it's funny. The Fed, Jerome Powell just told us uh, about 11 o'clock this morning. So it didn't even make my daily financial news. It will make it tomorrow. He basically said tapering is going to start. And now for the first time, nine out of the 18 Fed presidents think there will be an interest rate raise next year. If you watch my channel, that's not a surprise because I've been telling you for six months that they're going to raise rates sometimes in 2022. Now they agree with me. So they're clearly watching my channel. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, I, rates are going to, uh, rates going to spike in the next three to six months, probably not. And by spike, I mean, go from three to four. I think they trend higher from here. Uh, you know, I think they're 3.3335 by the end of the year. So not, not a spike, but I think, I think we've seen the bottom. I, I do at least we've seen the bottom until the next recession. We'll see what happens then. I love it. I love it. And then in terms of inventory, do you see inventory staying like it, it's slowly we're seeing it? Yeah, I was, I was really surprised by that. Existing home sales got reported today within the daily financial news. Uh, sales were down, which it, it's it's slower. I think it was down 2% of memory serves, but inventory was actually down. It was down 6%. I'm shocked. Uh, I think it's a blip. I think it's kind of the August slowdown going into this. I do think inventory trends up. It went from 3.32 to 1. Point, I'm sorry, 1.33 to 1.26. It went down 6%. Um, I think it trends up from here. I think it could be one and a half, 1.6 by the end of the year. Uh, I just think real estate slowing down. It's getting more unaffordable. Kind of the earlier question about San Diego, less people get yes answers. Um, interest rates go up, don't help as a conversation with Dustin probably talked about earlier. Uh, I, I think I think the whole, I think the housing slowdown has started, and th and that's been my theme for ninety days is is where the housing slowdown, not a crash, just a slowdown. We're not going to have twenty offers in the first twenty four hours anymore. A you know, April was such an unusual month. That was anybody who was buying and selling in April. That, that's not normal. That's not normal. I love it. I love it. So, for those of you, does anybody not have the book? <laughs> One rental at a time. Does anybody not have the book? Okay. Let's see your show of hands. Okay. So here's what I want to do. Take a picture of this, right? Take a picture of the screen and then post it on your social media. Send Michael and I a shot of it. I've got some books still left over. Michael was generous and gave us some books for our mastermind. Um, and what I will do is I will ship out a handful of books, post it. If I have more, more people, I'll do a drawing. And we'll get some books out. Michael, tell them about the book that's coming. Yeah, so I am in the tail end of writing a book called One, uh, One Rental at a Time, 15 Conversations with Real Estate Millionaires. So again, this YouTube channel I have has allowed me to speak to lots of successful people. The original book was Olivia and I's story. It's the only thing I knew. The next book is 15 other stories from different parts of life during Burr and apartment syndication and ninth grade dropouts and felons. And basically it's 15 people from different lot walks of life that uh, did something with real estate. I'm hoping it's out early October. It's, it's a lot harder to get a book published than it probably should be, but uh, yeah, we're still battling that out. 
I love it. So what we're going to do is when the book, we figure out when once we get a launch date on the book, we're going to do a pre-sale event. So we'll do another meetup sometime in the next two or three weeks. We'll do a meetup, we'll do a pre-sale, or we'll do something special for those of you that buy the pre-order book. So mm -hmm. um, Michael, as always, I want to thank you for all that you do for the real estate community. Um, again, for everybody out there, if you're not following Michael at One Rental at a Time, you see it there over his shoulder. The best, some of the best, I, I got to say top it, it to me it is the best but i just don't want to <laughs> it's okay know. top three is okay <laughs> top three I'll top it. three real estate content on youtube the best financial news out there you don't even need to read the newspaper or look at your yahoo news anymore just start following michael's one real at a time financial news thank you so much michael for all that you do thank you sub two community everybody for coming here on a late wednesday god bless have a great night everybody thank you <laughs>